Welcome to another rip-roaring edition of Hammerheads, or Hammerheads, if you prefer. Uh, we are Miles Watts. And we are Marcus Wilson. We are those people, and um, we, are, we are taking... We're, we're in, in a garden, in case you hadn't figured it out, in case you can, can't hear the, the bird song and distant and near dogs. Um, <clears throat> we're actually taking... Um, by a man in a helicopter. If you haven't seen The Beast Must Die, none of this will make any sense. <clears throat> but welcome to Hammerheads. Um, this is our semi-regular exploration of 17 of the best Hammer films over the course of 17 years, as, uh, as laid down by the BFI, who did a very good guide to a Hammer film a year for 17 years, which is sort of the height of their output between 1957 and 1974. So this is episode 15. And it's the first episode we've actually done in person rather than <laughs> over a Zoom link, which is is wonderful. Yeah. It's, it's lovely to be with you. It's this lovely summer's evening in the garden is very evocative of a uh, Victorian slasher movie in it does. dark old London town. It does sort of feel like someone could come staggering out of the bush bearing a, a, a knife, a bloodied knife, going, you know, doctor, doctor, help me. Um, yeah, which is, you know, obviously a bonus. So, um, yeah, this week we are <laughs> enduring. No, no, and that's not going to say enduring. That's not fair. We have watched the film from 1971, mm. Hands of the Ripper, which is Hammer's... It was the second film for... Is it Peter Sasdy? Peter Sasdy, the director, I think. <laughs> I believe it's his second or third directorial thing for them. Okay, yeah. Because um, he also did a uh, Countess Dracula. Did oh, it? Countess Dracula was the same year. That's right. Yes, because that got slightly nailed in by the critics, and, yes. and then when he did this, everyone went, "Well, this is an improvement." Some people said this one was an improvement. Um, but it's a bit of a departure for, for Hammer, isn't it? Because they're sort of yes. going back to um, true crime, I suppose. Yeah, this one felt like um, very much. Much a an attempt to sort of fit in with the slightly sh- slightly shocking bloody death movies of the seventies that were happening, and you know the late sixties, which we've talked about quite a lot in previous podcasts, that films were getting more and more provocative and daring and gory and sexy and all that. And I think Hammond by now, it's the early seventies, they are sort of trying to keep up with that. There is a feeling that they were they were trying for shock, almost like you know, say like Hitchcock's friend. It's yeah. quite shocking in places, and some of the deaths are quite uh, hard to watch because they linger on, on, you know, the blood, and they linger on the horrible expressions of the victims and stuff. And this was a bit like that, I thought. The, the senses have kind of gone on holiday for the last <laughs> few years, and yeah. um, there's also this trend to, to try and intellectualise what they're doing mm. through some kind of reference to psychiatry, psychology. Psychology, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, um, Freud is brought up quite a few times. We've discovered this new doctor called Freud. Yes. And I'm using his techniques to try and understand what's going on. I don't know why I've turned into James <laughs> Mason. It was meant to be, that was meant to be Eric Porter. But, um, yeah, so... Th- but this is, it's, um, I say it's true crime. It's not really true crime. It's, it's sort of imagined crime. Yeah. It, it harks back to uh, Victorian London and Jack the Ripper, of course, but the... Uh, Which we know from the opening scene where someone goes, It's the Ripper! It's, it's the, the Ripper! Ripper! <laughs> but this time they are focused more on the uh, the daughter of the Ripper, Anna, who is the main protagonist in, in this particular film. And um, actually it's written... Um, by a gentleman called Edward Spencer Shue, who Mm -hmm. was a court reporter back in the early 1900s. He wrote the... 
I think he wrote a novel um, based on this story. But no Anna, uh, in his story, Anna, I don't believe, is the daughter of the Ripper. Anna actually is the Ripper. Right. Um, so anyway, he was a court reporter who also turned his hand to fiction, but then um, L.W. Davidson uh, wrote the screen treatment for this oh, okay. one based on his fiction. Right, OK. And I thought the story was very sort of instantly, instantly silly and engaging, which is, <laughs> you know, oh, yeah, Jack the Ripper's at large. Oh, and then this woman goes, oh, it's you, you're the Ripper. And it's obviously her, his lover slash wife slash... Yes, you know, the mother of Anna. Yes. The mo- yeah, and then Anna is a little baby and a toddler and sees the, the murder and that's what sets her off. And then sort of years later, you're like, well, that's going to mess her up. And, you know, <laughs> um, so I thought... But that sort of sets the store out quite early for this film because I, I did enjoy this one. Now, you weren't sure first watch, were you? And then you watched it again... Yesterday. Yeah, I think it's um, it's not a major outing from Hammer. It's not groundbreaking. Mm. It's 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 a bit preposterous. The whole notion and any kind of psychology in the film is is just like ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, because uh, basically Anna sees her her father be accused by her mother of being the Ripper, and then yeah. her father kills the mother. Yeah in the presence of Anna when Anna's a very young age and um, the the idea is that because there are these he, she sees his her father kiss his mother before um, in the flickering light before he kills her yes and yeah there's this flickering kind of um, chandelier or something that she kind of sees but the light plays around the room mm. and therefore <laughs> every time after that she ever sees a kiss or there's there's this flickering of light she, she turns into the, like her father or something yeah She's she's out to kill. Yeah. In ever more gruesome ways. And it's sort of it's weird because you know we'll get into the story, but it sort of reminded me of two films actually. One was um, Marnie, oh, yeah. which is you know obviously yeah. a psychological thriller in terms of every time she sees the colour red, she associates it with um, rape and being abused and all that kind of stuff, and she she just goes to this fugue state. I think that's what the story. I haven't watched Marnie for a while, but I think that's what the story is. And um, also, it reminded me quite a lot of an American Werewolf in London, which might seem okay. at first like, what? But if you saw as it went on, I was like, right, well, you've got the the very posh doctor yeah, who takes Pritchard, yeah. Pritchard, played by Eric Porter, who is takes... Is he actually a doctor or is he a kind of well, he's sort of a, certified doctor? He seems to me like, you know, like in... Um, I mean, in Sweeney Todd, um, Judge Turpin is, is actually a judge, but he takes in the girl after killing her mother and he's now says oh she's she's now my ward and then he tries to court her and i got that vibe although i didn't get that but the vibe that eric porter was i get the feeling that he was possibly asexual i don't know but there was also a little bit of perviness i don't in know that. well let's come back to that because <laughs> we'll come that, back to that, that. that was the main thing in the film for me that, that kind of was playing on my mind what, yeah what, what his exact relationship with anna was yeah well we'll come to that but yeah and so american world for london that eric porter's character pritchard reminded me of a little bit of um, John Woodvine's character, who is a doctor in American Wealth in London, because he's very posh and he's very like trying to work out what's going on with David, who's the guy who got, you know thinks he's thinks he's a wolf. Yeah. He thinks yeah. he thinks he thinks he's a wolf, but he yeah, is because he says, you know, isn't doesn't it follow that if he was bitten by a werewolf, he'd be become a werewolf at the next full moon. I don't mean running around on all fours and barking at the moon. And that's his performance, Eric Porter's performance reminded me a bit yeah. of that, or rather the other way around. So, and then, you know, the fact that he took in Anna, and Anna was, the you know, the victim in all of this, whereas David's the victim in all of, you know, it's not David's fault, he gets bitten by a werewolf, so, and um, becomes a monster every time something happens. So yeah. it sort of reminded me that of that. Maybe just, I just put, put too many parallels in there, but... Um, I think yeah. they, they sort of underplayed that, though, because with the American Werewolf in London. Well, oh, there, there is the American Werewolf in London. In That's my dog Edgar. He's uh, <laughs> he's looking. He's like hunting frogs or something. Okay. He's decided to he's decided to hunt frogs around the very area where we're doing this podcast. So, um, oh. you know. Um, so in American Werewolf in London, then there is this sort of you know, will he won't he? Will he turn into a werewolf? Yes. Whereas in this film, I don't think there was ever any doubt that Anna was the murderer.
Order, That's even true. in that first scene where you've got the kind of politician yeah. in, in the room who's trying to kind of, uh, he's paid her benefactor. Almost, yeah, it's yeah, like he's a benefactor. Lady, yeah. And um, he's kind of paid her to, to take her virginity or whatever. And um, Actually, that is a bit dodgy, isn't it? <laughs> and, and so you would expect that he would be the person who would be um, immediately in the frame for murdering this, yeah. this, this woman, the yeah. clairvoyant. But actually, it's, it always is pretty obvious that it's Anna, and Anna well, that's going to be the one who's going to. Yeah, no, sure. And one of the, one of the great things about Werewolf in London is that it spends the first hour going, "Is he? Is he going? Yeah. Is he going mad? Is he going mad?" And he's like, "Maybe." And then it's like, "No, he very much isn't. <laughs> he very much is a wolf." So it's that that's well done. But yeah, you, yeah it is sort of. It sort of reveals that very early that she's going to be the one who's affected by it. It's not a twist. No. Because actually, the. the uh, and, Dysart, you know, the character, the politician, is. Yeah, is Dysart, that, I mean, he's, he's a despicable man, but he, mm. you know, he, he never seems like the sort of person who's going to have killed her. No, he doesn't, does he? He's and a I suppose. Weak man. Yeah, yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. He's not. He's sort of a non character, isn't he? I mean, there's a couple of good scenes of. Again, I thought this was. This had some. I don't know whether it's great acting, but it had some, some interesting scenes between those two. Yeah, the character actually are all fantastic yeah. in this film. The acting is, is really good. I noticed there was a chap in it, and I'm going to not do him a service today uh, by forgetting his name, but Marcus, you've got the cast list there, but he yeah. was in a Faulty Towers episode. Was he? Yeah. He's, Which one's this? He's the one with the mutton chops, and he, um, is he... Is he the one that's sort of trying to figure out what's going on with Anna, and he... Is this Dysart, the, not the politician guy? Oh, yes, it is Dysart. Yeah, Dysart. Sorry, it is Dysart. So he, this he, is... Uh, Derek Godfrey. Derek Godfrey was in an episode of Faulty Towers and he plays um, a complaining... Well, he doesn't complain to Basil. It was the Waldorf salad one. Uh, until at the end, yeah, he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and then and then he fobbed me off with... The, you know, and then when his wife complains, he decides he's going to complain. Um, but he, he reminded me of that. There's always a Faulty Towers actor in, in here somewhere. Yeah. In one of these films. Um, but yeah, the overall vibe was quite interesting, I thought, because I thought the whole thing was quite silly. Yeah. But then I always say with a horror film, um, and this goes for modern horror films, I always enjoy them if they have one of several things in them or two two or three several things, and one of them is memorable deaths. Yeah, there are memorable deaths aplenty in this. A, a few laughs, which this had no, not, this had no laughs at all. No. Um, no. And just a couple of good characters with, you know, good scenes. So, but memorable deaths is a huge thing. And I don't necessarily mean torture porn or, you know, those rather nasty sore m- deaths that kind of thing but this had some quite like uh, out there death scenes yeah with with people who didn't really deserve to die as well like a lot of them like poor Linda Barron Linda Barron from Open All Hours Nurse Gear Gear Gladys Emmanuel Um, she gets stabbed in the hand and through the eye with some hairpins Hairpins, which is pretty nasty she gives this amazing um, sort of what's the word it's almost like vaudevillian performance yeah she is really over the top really over the top I mean it's great She's a great. Lady of the night. And then when she dies, she's sort of out into the street holding her hands up. And, oh, oh. Yeah. She's like waggling her hands around, going, Oh, I am dying, like in an opera. Um, and I wonder what direction she got for that. Yeah. Because she's, I know she's meant to be a sort of bordello lady, she isn't she? Of, yeah, she was kind of hamming it up quite a lot. And then, Very there, was, hammy. then there was Dolly, the, the housekeeper. Dolly. Um, in Pritchard's house. Yes. Who, for some reason, looked like a barmaid Ooh. out of um, the, the Queen Vic or something. I'm not quite sure. She <laughs> did look very like. And the Dora Bryan was a really good it, to see Dora Bryan in there as well. I thought the Dolly, the housekeeper, was a bit cool. Blimey, you're going to be a lady. It was a bit, all oh, a bit like My Fair Lady or something. Wasn't she it? was terrible. I mean, she was great, but she was terrible. She reminded me of the housekeeper in the Railway Children as well. I'm going to give you a right good hiding. <laughs> um, yeah, I think mean, she was a certain type of character, wasn't she? Which is effective yeah. for the film. But it was it's full of shorthand. Yeah, it was a bit lazy. It reminded me, I suppose, a bit of the Phantom of the Opera, the Hammer film we watched. You know. From it, two well, years yeah, ago now yeah. but um, uh, it's sort of it's got that very very um, arch hammy over the top vibe that you almost think this is a joke this and kind is, of a city vibe because a lot of yeah. the Hammer films particularly Dracula and Frankenstein are kind of based more in kind of rural parts or that's like, a good point whereas this and um, I mean it was Paris wasn't it Phantom yeah. of the Opera was set in yeah that's right London. no that's a good point actually yeah maybe it's, that's the, the comparison is that this is London that was Paris and there yeah. is a sort of yeah there isn't the country house with the horse-drawn carriages it's kind of like um back 
to back housing and it's just yeah, it's all kind of warrants and streets, and, isn't it? And people kind of ch- and like try to find people chasing each other through the back streets, and it's yeah. Cool. So it's quite interesting. But then I thought um, it just kept things going quite interestingly. I was quite I was quite hooked on this one. Um, I I know it's not like the best, and the characters weren't that interesting and stuff. But for some reason, like, it kept me watching. So. <laughs> Uh, just to let you know, folks, we've had to come indoors because um, after talking about werewolves, uh, my dog Edgar decided to go obsessive about chasing down a frog or something under the decking where we were recording that episode. So the second half of this episode will now transition to my office. Uh, if you could imagine a roaring fire and a big Chesterfield chair <laughs> and uh, us sitting around drinking port <laughs> uh, like the criminologist in uh, a little <laughs> Rocky Horror Picture Show. And we continue. Yes, the housemaid reminded me of... The housemaid. Oh, the housemaid, yeah. Of, of, yeah, the railway children as a character. So I'm going to turn all your hides if you don't watch it. And it's just that guy called Bli- Blimey Governor. And like in films like From Hell and films that d- depict London quite badly, yeah. it's all a bit war, water, right, cockney, knees up, you know, pies for sale, oh, it's the ripper kind of thing. And there was that vibe to it. <laughs> she is... Um, oh, Sarah Green's mum, isn't she? Whoever does Dolly... Uh, is it Mar- Margie Lawrence? Oh, no way. Yeah, Sarah Green, the presenter uh, of British television. Of, of um, yeah. Blow Pater. Yeah, that's right. Oh, that's yeah, yeah. amazing. Is she still alive? Uh, she is... Uh, dead. Dead. Oh. 2010. Damn it. Yeah. I really, really hope she'd still be with us. <laughs> I don't. I've only just found out who she is. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, again, there was a pretty good cut in this. I don't think it was super interesting. I actually thought the most interesting... I thought Anne Harrod... <laughs> Uh, Harry Reese. Reese yeah. was very good as Anna in parts and in some parts a bit bland. I thought the best actress in it was probably Jane uh, Mero as Laura the Blind um, yes. fiancé of yes. uh, Pritchard's son. Yes. But I'm completely puzzled as to why she was put in the story like this yeah. blind fiancé. Yeah. Do, yeah. Like, it was that sort of blind character, that the blind girl who sees more than all the people... Yeah, with, it was a bit like that, counseling. wasn't it? Like, they could have had something a little bit cleverer. But she didn't drive the plot. No. She, it wasn't any twist related to the fact that she was blind. It was no, just... and at the end, obviously, she's, you know, she there is a sort of a moment where she could have fallen the over whispering, the... Whispering gallery thing, whispering but gallery. again, the blindness doesn't really even come into that. Have you ever been in the whispering gar- gallery at St Paul's no, Cathedral? No, no, no. My God, don't go up there. No, actually, get, don't go up there. You've yeah, got terrible, terrible, like, go. yeah... Um, I've got this I don't have vertigo but do you get dizzy like really dizzy at places like I have that thing with vertigo where it feels easier to just throw yourself off a sp- rather than kind of yeah. keep your balance you it's, see, just I, like, so it's, it's, it's just easy I'll just let myself fall I it's wonder I was looking at this scared. I was wondering if you've got what I've got which is which is what I think is called basophobia which is fear of falling so if you're up really high you can feel the sense of oh my god I really don't want to fall I'm really high up I'm not going to go Sit with me. Oh. I get that thing of like, uh, it's too much the urge to, just... to keep my balance and stay on here, so I may as well just let myself fall. Which I is, can't be which bothered. Is, that's to why stay. it's so terrifying. Yeah, that is terrifying. God, you have the urge to. But I had. Yeah, I mean, that's I a natural urge for people to go Whoa, at the end of cliffs and stuff, isn't it? But, but I had an incident when I was quite young. I was on, the, oh. it was on a school trip. It was a kind of trip with a friend or something, and I went climbing on. Um, was it Burt Crag or something? Oh, oh. And uh, it was one of these things we'd kind of climb up the rocks with some friends and things. We didn't know how high up we were, but we mm. had to crawl through this this kind of very low ceilinged part of the rock face. And, yeah. and so we kind of clambered through this, and I was going first. And then I kind of got out of this I could, place where I could stand up at the end of this kind of narrow and very short tunnel. Mm. And when I stood up, I realised I was on a, like a precipice looking straight down. It was like a 20 foot <laughs> drop or something. Oh my God. I was only about sort of eight or nine or something. And uh, yeah, friends father had to talk me down that was your vertigo moment wasn't it i had somehow had to turn myself around from this narrow ledge go back oh, into that's this terrifying. kind of like stooped position down below these two oh my god this rock and then I get didn't back know that. and again that was when i was thinking ah oh, it's just gonna be easier to let myself fall oh my god that's <laughs> bizarre isn't it i remember yeah. a similar incident but i just it wasn't as freaky but i was on the viaduct at um crimple oh, yeah. the, the disused viaduct yeah. rail, railway bridge and i climbed over the edge and sort of and then I realised 
I was stuck on the ledge right. and I had to do the similar like, I had to, tip, I had to turn around and get back yeah. I thought God, I could have easily have fallen about 50 feet yeah yeah you know stupid stupid boy yeah. um, natural selection well you do <laughs> you do but when you're a kid you just scramble up everything don't you rock faces and trees yeah, and that's right you know um, anyway we're getting off the off, off the, the topic point. but the thing is the film uh, what I like about the film is it ends in St Paul's Cathedral um, and there's well, you know the shot of her coming through the whispering gallery was that superimposed because one shot that looked terrible there are a few shots that looked terrible yeah. they, they had to they weren't allowed they wanted to shoot at St Paul's Cathedral and they weren't, weren't allowed, allowed so, so they, they got had to some recreate plates and, the, right. the, 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 well they did it very badly <laughs> they did but then at the end because there's the, there's the kind of mural on the floor and things and, yeah, and then the she, metal she, she, spoiler alert she kind of falls on top of um, uh, Mr John yes Richard yes and um, they end up in this, this sort of portmanteau thing where they're kind of almost at the edge of this this sun which looks like like the mosaic on the floor of St Paul's looks like a sun, and yeah. A, and I'm sure that must be like some kind of mm. um, painting or something. I, I could that right. composition seems to be like memorable from oh, okay some kind of I don't know Caravaggio or something. Yeah, oh, uh, maybe like, it, maybe it, it felt is. like he was trying to recreate a, a kind of famous. Oh, maybe well, it was. Something. Maybe it was. Yeah, they, they thought it was trying. And I to... wondered because it, it looked like an eye as well when they were kind of focused down on this yeah. sort of eye, and then there was the blind woman at the top and things. And it was oh, like, you've read I, a lot more into this. I read a lot I'm... more into, but I still couldn't work out why the blind <laughs> thing and why. Well, there's the... nothing much about this thing. online, is there? This no. film. We usually do a bit of research and, like, it's you know, you check out a little, few, but... yeah, a few reviews and go to the wiki, see if anyone's written anything there, and then you can sort of look up a few facts and stuff. And this just there's not much about this online. I don't know if it's. I think people that really like it know about it and everyone else just disregards it or doesn't really rate it. Yeah, um, I don't know. I've just kind of probably tried to read things into it which weren't there, which is, <laughs> is kind of, again, a frustration with this film. Mm. So the th- w- one thing about... Um, let's go back to the relationship between Anna and Pritchard. Yes. Pritchard, obviously... Eric Porter. Eric Porter. He sort of realises that Anna's killed her... Um, uh, the, the the clairvoyant lady who she's been yeah. by skewering her through the door yeah to start but thinks that you know the, the, basically what he says is I, I think you know people have been murdered for centuries and centuries mm. and, and you know I want to I've, I've studied Freud I think I can I want find to know a way why of stopping yeah stopping people from murdering yeah and then like there are many other characters in the film that says no she's possessed it's yeah like, you can't do this through which would be the old Freud. way of yeah, hammer like you know she's an ancient Ancient curse. Yeah, that's and, right. I suppose it's old hammer versus this new kind yeah. of psych- cod psychology thing. Yeah, which is like in Psycho, when the, you know the, the doctor at the end of Psycho is trying to analyse Norman Bates, and uh, you know it just sounds ridiculous. I mean, Hitchcock had real contempt for psychoanalysis, apparently. Right. Which is yeah, you know, yeah, right. interesting. You'd be like, yeah, he would, wouldn't he? Because um, if you analysed Hitchcock, you'd be like. Um, <laughs> Interesting. Mm, tell me about your mother. Well, the, the screenwriter, <laughs> funnily enough, actually, I think, wrote for... Um, did he write for the uh, Hanco- uh, uh, Hitchcock's... Hitchcock's half hour. <laughs> Hancock's half hour. A pint? That's no, really an awful. I think he wrote for the Hitchcock um, okay. TV shows as yes. well. So. Alfred Hitchcock present. Yeah, yeah. This would be great. Um, yeah. So there was that, and um, even though Anna keeps murdering... Like, mm, he, stop he, it, Anna. He keeps seeing her murdering people horrendously. Yes. He's still like, oh, Oh, well, I can still I can do something about this. Like, yes, but then he's got that there's savior also that complex. He's got it? the savior complex. Yeah. yeah, so you don't know whether he's doing it out of kind of goodness or ego. But then there's this thing about you know is is she just is he trying to have his way with her? As well, well, there is that. There is a hint of that in this as well, and there is that yeah. kind of slightly uncomfortable thing that she kind of gets taken into the household. Yeah. So the fiance of his son can't stay in yeah. his, his wife's old room because Anna's taken over. Over in this, mm. his wife's room, and it, the, yeah, there's all that kind of side to the psychology, the Freudian stuff as well. I must admit, it was pretty grim that he walks in on her when she's having a bath naked, and she's and just yeah, naked, and like, it's oh, like, no, he's just, a, <laughs> yeah, either he is asexual or um, no, he is that, trying so. to. But I wonder because I was reading about Eric Porter and he was a, a gay actor and he was very oh. tortured by the fact that he was gay because he couldn't be openly gay back then without consequences. You know, people used to get in prison. And, and, and tortured and, and uh, vilified and all this and apparently he just really had trouble with it so I wonder if knowing that going in I was thinking he seems like he could be 
a, a gay man in the film. And obviously they're not saying that in the film because you wouldn't do that in a 1971 Hammer film. But I was thinking maybe, well, it wouldn't it be interesting if he was... No, he's not interested in her sexually. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's, maybe just, again, that's, that's a disadvantage for me knowing too much about the actor. Um, because in the film, he doesn't come across as creepy, creepy. Because he, he could have, like... No. He could have, like... <laughs> I know he walks in on her in the bathroom, but he could have like sort of had his way with her very forcefully if he wanted to. But he he sort of seemed in, morbidly interested in solving her problem. Whether he crossed a few lines but in that, that regard is another is matter. That savior complex. He did. He had the savior it's complex. Like that yeah. Mr. John thing, and she kind of falls falls down onto him. Yeah, there's, there's definitely that kind of I'm your mentor and your I own you. But well. he's obviously he's obviously completely <clears throat> madly besotted by her in some sort of way. Yeah, it's just a, a, as as kind of a protege because. Yeah. The first thing that he he, he knows that he's she's killed um, the clairvoyant lady mm. like really violently. Yeah. And so he takes her in from the, the the police cells. He takes her into his home. Mm. And the first thing he does with her is not you know restrain her or kind of get mm. someone to watch over her. It's like oh you must come out to my son and f- his fiance's um, dinner party. Yeah, like he's showing her off. Like and she's like he a... just like lets her get the the kind of horse and carriage on her own. Or something. Yeah, that is what, weird. What the that hell is that and then it's sort of callback, isn't it? Like I really shouldn't have left her on her own. <laughs> Like, oh, maniac. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's a strange guy, and um, it, I mean, almost like sort of, you know, not quite as beastly. But when we watched um, Frankenstein Must Be Destroyed a few films ago, Frankenstein's problem in it is that he has lost his mind and he's just decided that he is going to, you know, transplant this brain into another man's. And it's similar ish in that he's this guy thinks he's Henry Higgins, you know what I mean? And she's Eliza Doolittle. And he's going to sort of like introduce to society as well as solving yeah. her psychological problems that she can't stop killing. So it's like, that's a bit weird and creepy. But I sort of got the feeling that he was less motivated by that and more obsession with proving how. But again, he didn't see. And I wonder if it was Eric Poor's performance because I thought it was a great performance. It's very mannered and clipped and sort of. That's why it reminded me of John Woodvine in, in uh, America, where for London. It was very sort of like he was trying to provide, like he says, you know, a woman can, a woman couldn't, surely couldn't. Um, the other guy goes, surely you couldn't uh, stab a woman through a door, a four-inch oak door, and her rib cage and all this. And the guy goes, yeah. well, you know, people can commit atrocious acts when the, you know, the adrenaline's going, and they can have monstrous superhuman strength kind of thing, which is very American well for London. Right. So, um, yeah. I don't know if John Landis has ever seen this film, but uh, yeah. but there were just parallels, but I sort of see those in, in everything. But There's that real mishmash of things in this, isn't there? It's sort of the it's big, odd one. Pygmalion thing. Yeah. The, the, like, then there's this whole kind of cod psychology it's an odd duck, isn't and then it? There's like this blind woman for no yeah. reason. And <laughs> yes, and that could have like her her husband, her boyfriend, is a complete drip. Yeah, that character is a complete drip. She was quite interesting because she's quite poised and the fact that she's blind and the fact that she's quite graceful. Yeah, she's great. Actress, Do you know what I mean? And, and yeah, could have quite magnetic presence. On yeah, well. she could have been a bit more. They like, could have made her a yeah, bit more of a like figure she to Anna. Able to solve the issue, the issue, yeah. or kind of plead with Pritchard to kind of see the error of his ways or yeah. whatever but it just felt that she was really underused but it's only it's only an 85 minute movie and they just must have left so much out yeah. in favour of you know I mean the killings are how many killings there's like about four or five there's four or five there's like a there's a throat slit yeah there's, or, the, there's the, the it's hat. all kind of stabbings in various stabbings kind of, uh, innovative ways yeah it's all to do with because you know it's to do with the ripper isn't yeah. it really it's supposed to sort of I think one of the critics said it seems to be a sort of like a, a, a play on or a, a, an interesting artistic array of stabbings and that's what the theme yeah. of the film is but there's also this, not that this, much more to it this thing that they throw into the mix like the um, the dice art politician character mm. who obviously has very questionable morality but then he's kind of questioning everyone else's morality yeah. and it is like whether it's the kind of fake clairvoyant or the you know yeah. this, this is we can't tolerate this this is yeah. bringing society down and it's like well you were paying to have like oh yeah yeah. with an underage woman or something. Yeah, like, again, like, um, was it was it Curse of Frankenstein we were watching where 
they're all this horrible beastly bunch of men in the pub at the beginning and uh, they're all they have like a club of men yeah do you remember is it, it probably wasn't Curse of Frankenstein um, that's that's too early but yeah it's got that it's a real mishmash so what they didn't do in the film is really explore the whole Freudian I thought like when Anna turned into you know she went into the trance because of the flickering light and then yeah. she gets kissed that was the least interesting part of the film for me she was the least interesting part of the yeah. film because you were like okay she goes into a trance and wanders around like a zombie well it was, she was like that zombie yeah character, wasn't she? yeah she was like, yeah I thought Frankie they could have Stein's monster or something she's like that her dad's created a, li- a little so. bit yeah so she cause I think they could have I think this is the most critical we've been in a Hammer film isn't yeah. it because I, I did enjoy it but I think it could have been way more that's what the thing about it, that's what I was into it and I, th- I thought it was enjoyable but there were lots of things I was like yeah that could have been better that could have been better that could have been better and one of the central things was the characters the characters were not really fully sketched out but there were yeah. some good scenes in this one um and I don't really even explore how her father is acting through her or anything. No. They could explain the mechanisms by which that happens. Well, they do, like, you know, Long Liz is the character played by yeah, um, Gladys Emanuel, um, Linda Barron, Linda and Barron. she, Long Liz, was apparently the third victim of Jack the Ripper. They just don't really uh, explain that. Yeah. They, like, you could have tied it really heavily into well, the Ripper. Well, I guess it could be because the book was originally about yeah. saying that she was the Ripper rather than the Ripper's daughter. So. Yeah. The other thing, yeah. I'll tell you what, the, the other thing that was really incongruous to me was um, I really loved the score, but the score, score was so, it just felt so jarring with what you were seeing on screen because you've so got romantic. this original yeah it's like yeah. this pastoral romantic yeah. flutes and kind of uh, strings kind of very 70s thing and yet it's over the top of this um, supposedly Victorian yes. kind of horror very urban it was incongruous you're right it didn't fit I, I, like Anna's theme almost whenever she kind of when she first witnesses her, her father kill her mother and then when she mm. kind of, you see her later there's this Anna's theme which is a beautiful piece of music but it's like but what the hell does that how does it kind Do you of know, add to what's on screen I, I, I wonder as well because I've been going on about American Wealth London I, won- I wondered who did the score because I thought this sounds like the score for American Wealth in London which I will um I'll send you some examples because Albert Bernstein did the score for American Wealth in London and yeah. uh, it, there's not much score in it but it's very effective and the, and there's a theme in Hands of the Ripper that sounds like one of Albert Bernstein's scores I mean obviously okay. that Ripper came first uh, and I wonder if that sort of compounded the the similarities for me yeah um, that kind of whole kind of romantic nature of the yeah. music was like oh, well no <laughs> Yeah, it's not romantic. Yeah, no, that's it. It's implying in romance. Romantic. No, no. Pritchard isn't... Ro- I mean, not that we know of is romantic with Anna. It's like he's got this strange teenage zombie yeah. who go- who he's trying to sort of mould, and it just wasn't quite... None of the story strands kind of went anywhere, and then, it, like the Phantom of the Opera, it's like, well, let's just throw him off a tall building at the end. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah that's right. Also, that's she would have splattered into quite a mess if she'd fallen off the Whispering Gallery. <laughs> so it's, it's Christopher Gunning, the... Um... Yeah, I didn't know him. Yeah. I mean, I think he's done a lot of um, film music. But if you're a massive dork like me, you will go off now and you will listen to the score for Hands of the Ripper and then you will listen to the score from American Wealth in London and you'll find the theme that links them because it's very similar. It's almost the same notes. Um... Yeah. I'm not sure Elmer Bernstein would have seen and copied this film <laughs> ten years later, but um, but yeah, as a film score fan, I noticed that that similarity as well. So that's a yeah. Oh, he he did the the score for Porterhouse Blue. Yes, he did Porterhouse Blue, and also didn't he do Poirot? We know because yeah, did, didn't he do the music and... for um, what did we watch last time? Amazing how it falls away, isn't it? <laughs> the film we watched last episode, episode 14, had, I think, the same composer, because we said at the time, oh, yeah, did yeah, Poirot it's do? I really like the... I was just watching Poirot Hasbro the other day, actually. I really like the kind of choral music in, in, at the start of that. Yeah. Yeah. University choral thing. It always freaks me out, Porterhouse Blue, because at the end, you're so disappointed. You're like, oh, things just continue the way they continue. <laughs> and everyone's a horrible Tory. And <laughs> Porterhouse Blue. If you haven't seen Porterhouse Blue, uh, it's a fantastic this series. It's a sort of 1980s Channel 4 production. Yeah. Um, multiple parts. David Jason playing a, a porter in uh, a Cambridge college that's gone bad. Yeah. They're basically... <laughs> 
eat Etonians who have gone incredibly. I mean, they just eat sort of roast swan and stuff, and it, it's Richard, basically yeah. it's about how it's about the sort of corruption of uh, the innocent into horrible uh, upper class society. <laughs> very good, yeah. Tom Tom Sharp. Tom Sharp novel. Yes, very good novel. Very good TV Eddie series. Richardson is in it, and, and um, David Jason. David Jason, yeah. So watch that because it was the same music as the film we're talking about now. <laughs> so that's the tenuous. <laughs> that's the tenuous link. Um, well, I think that probably covers Hands of the Ripper, doesn't it? We're just scrabbling around now trying to find what well, episode sixteen is going to be. We've only got. Is it Vampire Circus next time? I think it is Vampire Circus. We've <laughs> only got three films left, which is quite exciting. Um, the, the, I love the the still for Vampire Circus is a lady dressed up as a tiger with body paint on. Yeah, that's um, right. It I went. Like well, it's going to be completely free. I think we're getting into psychedelia and stuff, aren't we? And then we've got a couple left, and one of them's a Dracula and one of them's a Frankenstein. Yeah, so we've got Vampire Circus next time. Yeah. Uh, The Satanic Rites of Dracula. That's right. Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell, which looks crazy as you like. So there is, I don't know, I have no idea who's in um, Vampire Circus, but I I will do some research before we watch it and talk about it. But then we've got Peter Cushing and and Christopher Lee coming back, haven't we, for their last performances, which is nice. So it's a good list. Van Helsing and, and Dracula. So, um, oh, yeah. but yeah, I, I enjoyed Hands of the Ripper, but it's also slightly weird, bizarre, and also it's, I would call it quite a flaky film, really. It's Fla- a bit of a flaky <laughs> film. It's, it's worth a watch just to kind of see if you can work out what the hell they were thinking. Also, it's on ITVX at the moment. Oh, so yeah. I, when I came to watch it, I was like, right, how am I going to watch this one? Am I going to rent it? Am I going to what, what? Oh, and there it was on ITVX. So uh, it's on as as of time of recording, which is May 2024. You can go watch. Hands of the Ripper on ITVX. So yeah, this and leave a comment if you can, you know, make anything more of it than we did. Yeah, yeah, you might know things about it that we don't and we're missing. Yeah. But uh, yeah, thank you again for watching and commenting, and uh, we really appreciate it. And 